I'm Kate and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here welcome to my channel. Today I have a really amazing project that I got the opportunity to work on. My grandparents, really amazing friends, have had this antique white rotary machine in their family for generations and it got down the chain and eventually they decided that they wanted to sell it but I... <laughs> I don't know how I got this lucky. They ended up giving it to me to fix up and work with. It is most likely from around the 1930s because it came with its original manual, which this book, book number 12, was printed in 1930. Um, the machine is patented at the very latest in 1913. So somewhere in there, this machine was born. I have never owned a treadle machine before and I have never undergone any kind of restoration endeavor before. I am absolutely not an expert. This machine got to me in a beautiful condition. The repairs I had to do were very minimal except for buying a new belt and greasing up some of the gears, cleaning up the wood. But really, I did not have to do much. But I will try to explain everything that I did. The videos that I got my information from I will link in the description so be sure to check them out if you are interested in restoring your own antique machine. Oh also I hope you enjoy my new chair. It is a throne that I made for my grandmother's birthday and somehow we've ended up with four years later but I did make a jumpsuit out of the remnant fabric which I'm pretty proud of so anywho um let's jump right on in. Hi there, voiceover Kate here to let you know that step one of restoring your antique machine is going to be to read up on it. I was really fortunate to have my original manual handy, but you can find tons of great resources online about how to fix up antique machines, how to use antique machines, and if you happen to have my specific model of this white rotary machine, I'd be happy to send you any of my resources you need, so let me know. But it really just helps on knowing how to maintain the machine, clean it, fix it up. You can find tons of great resources, so definitely begin here. Step two is to clean the wood because antique machines have a really fantastic history which also means they have really fantastic spider webs. Mine was not that bad very fortunately but I did find a few little eight-legged friends which really ruined my day. But I didn't want to ruin the finishes on the wood because it's pretty beautiful and I hate changing too much about antique things so I just used some pledge to clean it up. If you had furniture polish that would also work great. But really just kind of cleaning out the cobwebs, cleaning out the dust, plus this helps to let you get to know your machine, so win-win. And honestly, really just get in every single nook and cranny because there is dust in there that who knows where it came from or how long it's been there. And yes, it's historical dust, but you really don't need it ruining the parts of your pieces and machines. So I got inside the drawers, inside the little handles, put on a headlamp, went under the table. I mean, really get into it find every single part of that machine that can be cleaned and clean it because chances are over the hundred years it's been around it's it's gotten pretty disgusting next up we're going to clean all the metal on the machine with a little bit of wd-40 i used it on a q-tip and on a rag and just kind of got in and really tried to clean the rust off but it is very stubborn so we're going to call it character for now but i did manage to get a, an okay portion off so go around clean up all the gunks and remember that the wheels on the treadle machine are going to need a little bit of extra lubrication since they'll have to spin. So go near the bolts and the screws, anywhere that has to move, clean it up there. And if you go under the table to clean looking upwards, please, please, please wear protective eye gear. It is very painful to have chunky rusty metal fall in your eye, not based on a real example. And woohoo, we are on to the main event, cleaning the actual machine. So I am once again just taking a whole ton of WD-40 and trying to get into all the gears, anything that moves, paying special attention to there. I did learn, however, that WD-40 can actually gunk up on stuff, which uh, I did not learn until after. I had liberally applied it to every part of this machine, so pro tip, don't do that. Also, while you have the machine out, now would be a good time to oil it. Don't wait until you get the belt on and put it in the table like I did, because it is much more difficult. And now would also be the time to check and make sure that all of your levers and spinning bits work. So the hand wheel, the stitch length controller, and the lever towards the front that releases the machine out of the table all need to be able to move for the machine to function. So check them right now. They may need professional help, but hopefully a little bit of good old fashioned grease should allow them to move enough to be functional and as you can see I've also laid down a big big trash bag onto this whole project because it is very messy. So, do not ruin your floors with this. Lay out something to protect them first. And now it's time for Out of Order Filming. 
So how I mentioned earlier, we're going to put the oil in right now instead of after you put it in the table like this already set up with the wonderful belt that will be impossible to get undone. Um, Bernadette Banner's video that I will link in my description actually does a really good job of explaining how the oil holes work and where to put oil on your machine. If you have the manual, it should have an oiling diagram, but also as you can kind of see, getting underneath the machine to all the gears on the underside is incredibly difficult once the belt is on. So oil the machine right now. There should be some that goes in the top and some that goes in the bottom. Now that we're all cleaned and oiled, we should be good to attach our machine to the table. But I ran into one little problem trying to activate this trapdoor thing, so let me cut to a live thing and see if I can explain it. This is kind of hard to see, but this is the attachment that hooks underneath a nut that goes around that long screw. And I couldn't find this table model anywhere, so I'm hoping that this is how it's supposed to go. But if you have a table like this and know more about how it's supposed to go, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. But otherwise, this latches onto this piece up here and then is balanced out by that bolt so that when you open up the table lid, like so, it should pull up that bottom piece for you and your machine can be attached in. But if you do know how it is supposed to hook up more correctly, I would really love to know. My dad and I have been fiddling with it for hours and it's a lot of guesswork, but so far this does work and it seems pretty stable. I learned this trick from one of the other tutorial videos I've linked below. It is to use a rubber band to hold the pins that insert into the back of your machine to hook it to the table in place, just like this. But in reality, using this on a white machine was a lot more difficult than it looked in the video because the video was a Singer machine and there is apparently an astronomical difference that I did not realize. White machines hook in a bit more snugly, so getting off the rubber band was kind of a nightmare. It might just be easier to ask someone else to help you, but it did work, so if you don't have anyone else available, this is fine in a pinch. Our next and final step in the restoration part of this project is just to get a new belt. Belts are made of leather, so they are going to deteriorate over time, so it's out with the old, in with the new. I got mine on Amazon for maybe $5. They're pretty cheap, pretty user-friendly. You are going to need a leather awl and a pair of pliers, though, and what you'll do is you will take the belt, thread it through the machine just how it would go in normally, so around the hand wheel and then through the big wheel underneath the treadle table, bring it back up, mark with some kind of pen where they meet up and you want to mark to the point where the belt isn't too tight or too loose. It should just feel sturdy because too tight will cause unnecessary wear and tear on the machine and too loose will come off when you're sewing. So mark it with a sharpie, cut off the excess, poke a hole right where you're going to stick the staple in, clamp the staple and you are good to go. And boom, baby, we're all done restoring so we can finally begin sewing. We're going to start by first threading our machine. If you don't have the manual, it can be really tricky to figure out, so I will try and explain it to the best of my abilities. Start by winding the bobbin. We're going to do that by disengaging the needle by flipping a little switch on the side of the hand wheel so that it can spin freely without moving the needle at all. Then we will take our thread, put it on the furthest right spool pin, and guide it through the little thread holes and wrap it around that middle section once so that the tension is correct. Then we'll stick it through the inside of the bobbin so that it comes on the outside. Stick the bobbin on the bobbin winder and then move the belts on your machine to the back side of the winder and raise the winder arm up pretty high, or as high as it'll go actually, and then you can begin winding your bobbin. To insert the bobbin in the bobbin case, you're going to want to pause and screenshot this next image right here so you know which parts I'm talking about when I say 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then what you're going to do is take your wound bobbin and put it so that the thread is coming off the side towards part 2 and just thread it through hole 1, then through hole 2, then take it over to the other side, down, hook it around 3, and you'll bring it up through 4. Once your bobbin is securely in your bobbin case, you are good to just insert the case into the machine. There should be a little lever that you'll need to pull the top part back and just insert it gently until it can't be pushed any further. Then let go of the lever and it should snap back into place and hold your bobbin. To thread the top thread on the machine, we are first going to move our thread from the right spool pin back to the center one. Then we will guide it around this first little pin and hook it under that washer, then take it down through the guide hole. Bring it and hook it around this pin and then up over the top of it. Up to the take up lever where it can be fitted in between this little guide holder that should catch it and keep it in the arm. 
then down to the needle where we will thread it through the little bar that keeps it in place above the needle and then to get it through the needle we're just going to thread it left to right which can be a little bit tricky but once you get the hang of it it's pretty easy. All that's left to do is use your hand wheel to make the upper thread grab the bottom thread just like you would on a modern sewing machine. It's not filmed very well but you should hold the upper thread in your left hand while you're grabbing the lower thread otherwise it can slip through. And then once you've done that you are all ready to sew! Okay, wow! Holy moly! With that, we are all done with our restorations! You are completely ready to do whatever you would like to do on this machine. I, myself, am going to be making a dress, and there will be a video of that, so stay tuned if you're interested. And also, the next few minutes are going to be me talking about the neat features on this machine. If you get motion sickness, I wouldn't recommend watching it because it's just on my handheld, but... Otherwise, we've reached the end of the video, so thank you so much for joining me. I really hope you enjoyed watching this because I had such an amazing time creating this, and I hope you have a really great day. Bye, love you! So, some neat things about this machine that may or may not be on yours if you happen to have a white rotary US machine. This knob over here controls the tension of the top thread. It's a lot like on a modern machine where this knob will control the top thread and the screw on the bobbin case will control the bottom thread tension. Minor adjustments make a huge difference. Over here we have our stitch length lever, which most machines, most modern machines go from one to five. This one goes from zero to seven, which is pretty amazing. And all of the stitches are incredibly well done, stay together very well, even without a back stitch feature. It also has the serial number intact. I'm not sure if it's the same with antique singer machines. Antique singer machines, you can actually track down the history of the machine with the serial number, so I will look into if white machines do that. It also has the patents written on the stitch plate, which is incredible. The presser foot control is back here, and it functions a little bit more rigidly than a modern presser foot, but still very easy to use and if you have this same stitch plate if you're having trouble getting it out there's just this little latch in here that pushes out and then when you want to put it back in you push the latch back in set it back down same with locking in the machine i have this little lock that undoes and allows the machine to lift out of the table i unfortunately can't get the spring to go past here so that it goes in and fully locks but it stays in the table well enough that it's not a problem for now, but I will keep working to get it into the fully locked position. It does have a little keyhole. I'm not sure what it unlocks. It came with all of these beautiful attachments, which are the different feet for the different functions this machine can do, which after reading the manual can actually do quite a lot. It does more than my modern machine, which is pretty incredible. Trying to do this one-handed is a bit difficult, but all of these have different lengths. There's a ruffler foot, a tuck foot, a hemming foot, a felling foot. So all really, really beautifully, pres all beautifully preserved as well. And then a few extra little gadgets that I haven't figured out what they do yet. I've also loved how easy it is to engage and disengage the needle. Um, while I've been reading the instruction manual, I've taken to just treadling. It does take quite a bit of practice to get used to, so make sure you always start it with your hand needle. I will definitely link some videos in the description that give some advice on treadling. But once you get the hang of it, it's actually really fun and it does that kind of weird phenomenon that you get when you're on a boat and you're going over the bumps on the waves. And then when you go home and lay down, your body still has that weird wavy feeling. It's like that in your leg muscles, so I find it really fun and really relaxing. I don't know why, but it does also just kind of help you get to practice treadling, which is very nice. And the desk itself is also really beautiful woodwork. It comes with little bobbin case. I don't have any extra bobbins right now. That's just decorative, but the drawers come all the way out. They have these beautiful rounded backs that slide in and out very easily. Just truly beautiful, beautiful work. The treadle pedal down here, you'd be able to see better once I move the trash bag out. 
um, is actually very comfortable, very ergonomical for your feet to sit on for long periods of time without making you too tired. My table also comes with wheels, which is pretty handy, except two of them are rusted still, so not that handy, but it did actually make the moving process a little bit easier, which was very lovely. And this whole machine just has so many fun features, like this little arrow that indicates the stitch lengths. Um, really just the beautiful painting and like the craftsmanship in this machine is just unbelievable and I am so grateful to have it in part of my collection.